The problems facing New Zealand's primary sector have been mounting at a rapid pace. So I think it's time for open hearts and open minds. Welcome to Sarah's Country. Now this is your home. I hope that you're enjoying the, around the matters that matter most to farmers and growers across Aotearoa New Zealand. Because navigating every twist and turn with resilience is hard. You know, but I know that a lot of farmers and growers do it every day and they don't even know that they're doing it. Because in New Zealand, it's head down, ass up, as I... Who cares? That's what we say. It's it's about um, just getting on and getting it done, isn't it? Uh, and that is what I'm so proud to be a part of in this role with uh, Rural Media and Bringing You Serious Country, a show that does it with an open heart and an open mind. I'm your host, Sarah Perry, and tonight we are going to talk about navigating change. We're going to talk about that word resilience. And the thing is about navigating a pathway forward when you do have a, a quite a storm ahead, you know, uh, imagine you're a pilot and there is a lot of weather. You can either get frustrated with the weather or ride out the turbulence going right through it or find a way around it. Do you ever check in and, and work out what your attitude is towards this? Um, the reason I do bring this up is, uh, yes, I do realise I was up against two other wonderful women in this country, Jacinda Ardern and Judith Collins. Uh, regardless of your political view, uh, they are the leaders of our two major parties in this country, political parties, that is. In the debate last night on air, yeah, I'd love to hear what were your thoughts who won, what was the thoughts, I mean, you're probably over it by now, and on to uh, other things. But I do want to talk about leadership. That is the one thing. Whether, you know, leadership is about communicating ideas articulately or is it about uh, leading from the front in a way of showing by example from your own experience? It's a very interesting one, especially with the two political party leaders uh, obviously being involved in issues around an unprecedented time that we have with COVID. And of course, yes, absolutely, you know, everybody does have their own opinion around their politics. I would love to hear tonight... I'm actually going to bring back up the comment we had last night because we didn't have a lot of comments come in because of the political debate, um, as well as talk about leadership. So we're going to do this again, Joel, because I'm, I, I, I'm desperate, desperate to find. Joel Rock is uh, heading around the North Island. For those who are watching live, wherever you are, you can comment below. Joel Rock, our producer here on Serious Country, heading off for a holiday, a week's holiday uh, I'm hope hopefully it's not for his mental health from working with me, but he's looking for ideas. So we're going to have this a go again tonight in the comments. Where do you believe in the North Island? He's just going to do the North Island. Should he visit? Easy question. There's amazing amount of places around uh, the country. All you need to do, and I get them here and I'll read them out throughout. But as I said, I want to talk about leadership. What makes a great leader? Uh, and if you've got any examples of a great leader you've had in your community, in your family, uh, in your whānau, in your uh, workplace, please put down in the comments below and let's celebrate it. And I will uh, talk about leadership with our guests throughout the show as well. Now, great lineup, really looking forward to it. The only thing I'm uh, worrying about a little bit too much with these guests is I know they all love to talk. So if we run over, we run over. Uh, who do we have tonight on the show sharing the stories that uh, matter from this week's Farmers Weekly and, of course, on farmersweekly.co.nz. Imagine still setting records well into your retirement. Well, one special Charolais bull is still punching well above its weight, his weight, on both sides of the Tasman Sea. This is following the Palgrove Charolais sale uh, this week. Brent Fisher from Silverstream Charolais, just here uh, near Lincoln on the Banks Peninsula, is going to join us after 7.20 to celebrate Silverstream Evolutions 
ongoing popularity at the age of 11. Following this week's border exemptions, 150 sharers are desperately still needing to uh, wait their turn to get into this country as we slide into that sharing season. After 7.30, President and New Zealand Sharing Contractors Association, uh, Mark Barrowcliffe, is going to join us to share his frustrations and, and paint a picture of what it's like on the ground. To close the show at quarter to eight, to round out Serious Countries Week, of course, Monday to Wednesday, if you've just joined us, uh, we produce uh, quality over quantity. That's the that's the method anyway. It's Mental Health Awareness Week. And industry motivator and mental health advocate Doug Avery is going to join us to his point he made in an article he did with Richard Rennie. Urge farmers struggling to adapt to more frequent droughts and responses to deal with the issue that he says is not going to pass with time. Of course, well, Doug is well known for his work with Resilient Farmer, the book, and of course his nationwide tours. But I believe that there's a depth to it as we all grapple with this issue together. First up on the show, it is set to be a $2 billion industry, if we can get this right. So for those wanting to grow a successful hemp crop, let's learn from South and farmer Blair Drysdale's journey and his family. He's going to join us shortly to discuss how his research and experience in planting the crop alongside his other uh, farming operation has been three years on. Looking forward to catching up with Blair very shortly. This is Sarah's Country. They spent 15 years looking to do something from paddock to consumer that was healthy and beneficial to people and hemp tick those boxes. I don't often do a bit of product placement, but this actually does live in my fridge. Hope Field Hemp Harvest to Health, 100% hemp seed oil. And uh, of course, hashtag not sponsored, but I do take it every day. So I'm very excited to uh, have Blair Drysdale on Sarah's Country. Blair and his wife Jodie and family are into their third season of growing hemp in their Southland farm. And it's still fine tuning how they, they do it in terms of the crop rotations over 10 hectares of hemp on the 320 hectare farm. Harvesting the seeds to then be pressed and turned into oil and sold online just like this. Uh, Blair joins us now. Welcome to Serious Country, Blair. It's a, an exciting, especially following that report by Dr. Nick Marsh, um, that we're set to potentially have a $2 billion industry and we're going to call you a pioneer. Uh, and years mm. go by. <laughs> Hello, Sarah. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, very, um, a really exciting report to see come out, and um, see the potential for the industry as a whole is, is huge. Um, and a, a lot of that is around, definitely around the, the fibre and CBD side is where probably some of the future potential lies. But um, hopefully, with some uh, law changes ahead, we can see some of that eventuate. So yeah, very exciting place to be. And I don't know about a pioneer, but um, yeah, some of an early adapter. I'm very open-minded to new things, and um, we jumped on, on an opportunity, yeah. Blair, can you start by telling our audience about the knowledge journey you went on to make the decision to grow hemp? Look, it's something we've been looking at for a long time, not particularly around hemp, so to speak, but um, something to take from that paddock to plate um, and to have that connection with the consumer long term. And it's just, um, we've sort of been looking at hemp prior to law changes in 2018, and and when those laws were changed in this country around human consumption, we decided to um, jump on it and probably um, a little bit naively and without a whole lot of prior planning. But um, as it's turned out, it's worked in the long run. So, yeah, it's a pretty um, exciting place to be. And uh, the rewarding part of, of this journey, so to speak, has been um, the feedback we get from the consumers. So, yeah, it's been very good in that aspect. Okay, I've got to give you some feedback. Uh, I think that my joints have improved. 
that's my piece of feedback since I started taking it, came under a recommendation. Um, and so well done. The reason we're talking to you, though, as well as, of course, off the back of this report, is Gerald Pickard from Farmers Weeklies uh, talked to you about the keys to getting establishment right and your learnings. I'm sure a lot listening and watching would love to know what were some of those challenges that you faced over the past three years that you can share that others can avoid? Oh, uh, look, and the biggest challenge for us here was around growing it without um, a chemist through input as far as establishment went. And it's been, look, um, it's, I've got to own up, it's been pretty tough going to this point and uh, pretty successful around that in the first year. Um, had our struggles the year just been through um, our establishment methods and around climatic conditions. But um, this year, we've, we think we'll have nailed the um, establishment with this drilling and um, next to or as close as we can to zero soil disturbance is the key to it without putting um, chemistry over it. So that's a tough one. And once you've got it in the ground and um, the, the seeding rate right and building a, you know, getting a good canopy established, it looks after itself pretty well. It's a very vigorous plant. Um, if, you, if you're patient enough and wait for the right soil conditions, temperatures, um, moisture levels, etc., you know, you put seed in the ground and it, you know, five, six days time, it's an inch to an inch and a half high. So it, um, it gets up and goes. And yeah, as long as you can get it to that point of canopy where it um, outcompetes the weeds, you've you pretty much got it done. Um, and then, you know, other things that we learned along the way is I probably had my um, direct input to weave it late um, the last couple of years. So, yeah, we'll just bring them forward to weave it. And um, it's just learning as you go. There wasn't a lot of knowledge out there Um well, it was probably it was out there that not that everyone's prepared to share it. So, you know, the internet was our friend as far as learning um, anything we could. And um, New Zealand Hemp Industry Association was very good. Some people in there within helping us, um, you know, learning how to grow it and uh, and further context. So, yeah, there's there's enough there. And I think people now are um, more willing to to help. You know, people establishing crops, and, and I think a lot of that also is around that stigma's gone of that attachment to. Um, marijuana too so that stigma is breaking down slowly so yeah it's a pretty good place to be at the moment and um, you know we'll continue learning you learn about this crop every day as you do every other crop but um we're getting there you know Rome wasn't built in a day and we're taking our time and we may we know we may not get it perfect this year but you know hopefully we'll get there can you tell our audience a bit more about how you build it into your rotation and what hemp needs but also to the fears of uh grazing animals alongside if they were to break in and um animal feed of course is uh, closely licensed and monitored when it comes to these licenses for hemp as well yeah, it's a very it's a rigorous licensing system, that's for sure. Um, it's quite well involved. Um, you got the, the police aspect to it, the whole nine yards and security. Um, yeah, look, I mean, as most farms do, you have very reliable and um, hot wire systems running around farms. We haven't had a problem with stop breaking in at all. Um, one of the frustrations around it currently, as far as the legal point of view goes, is um, the byproduct of pressing the seeds for oil is not being able to feed the what we call the hemp cake to livestock. So um, it's an area that we're trying to, to work on slowly and get a registered product um, and also working around getting some law changes in that area because it doesn't really make much sense when, um, you know, you and I can eat the byproduct of that pressing as a, as a flour or protein powder, but we can't feed it to our hens to get the eggs out of them. It doesn't really add up when we can um, we can make, you know, the chicken itself healthier for, for us consumers and eat chicken all the egg as well. So mm. um, there's a wee bit of work to go on in that area. Um, I understand um, why there's some worries around legalising the consumption of the plant as far as livestock is concerned due to our export markets. Um, I get that, but as far as um, the domestic market is concerned, I, I think it's very nonsensical to allow um, the consumption of it for animals. So, yeah, a lot of work going on in that area to try and make some changes there and, and hopefully we get them going forward because um, like any like any crop, it's, you know, a lot of, there's, there's a lot of um, prospects and, uh, you know, to go forward and around the byproducts of it too. So, yeah, and it's frustrating to put it mildly. Hey, Blair, we're asking all of our guests tonight, obviously following the leaders' debate last night, what in your mind makes a good leader? Wow, you're throwing me a curly there. Someone that leads, someone that quite literally leads by example. Uh, it's all very well standing up there and talking the talk, but um, you know, put the feet to the concrete and do the hard yards. That's a that's a good leader. Um, the leader isn't someone that stands there and says, you know, do as I do, um, not as I, you know, etc. 
So, you know, a leader that gets in there literally with a spade and does some of the groundwork and shows people how it's done, uh, that to me uh, is a good leader. And um, and I see that from, you know, being a volunteer fireman, good leadership is about those who get in there and show you how it's done and lead by example, not those that stand there and tell you how to do it and don't show you. So that's that's my idea of a good leader. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I think it's great advice. Uh, we've just had a new member start at Peoria Media, Tessa Prentice, and uh, she was planting trees on a farm alongside a man that she explained to her parents that night was uh, John Pino. Uh, they needed to sit her down and explain who he was, um, but she found that that was fantastic that uh, John and Maury were out there planting trees alongside her. So uh, absolutely, I think we have that uniquely in New Zealand. Now coming up in serious country, we are going to be joined by Brent Fisher from Silverstream Charolais. Uh, and the cool news is out of the back of the Palgrove Charolais sale over in Australia. Now the Evolution Bull from Silverstream has been leading leaving its wonderful mark on over a third of the progeny through this year's sale. And Brent will join us next to go to explain why this bull, who's still alive at 11 years old, has certainly turned heads. This is Sarah's Country. One of the first things you learn when you live out here is where to shop for the things you need to live out here. Like electric fencing. Or horse thief. Or bee suits. Children. Chuck food. Do you want a couple of these? Or something stylish to wear. Not everyone's got stuff like this. But at Farmlands we do, and then some. So if you need anything to help your farm... Grow. Milk. Dredge. Rear. Come on in. Because we're out here too. Delicious doesn't start in a single moment. Or with a single ingredient. Delicious starts here. Now, I'm just going down into the comments here. It's fantastic. We're calling for two things tonight. One is um, to carry on the theme of Joel Rock's North Island tour. Where do you believe that he and his partner, Sarah, should visit on the month off in October? Uh, Doug Avery, who will join us towards the end of the show, straight off the bat is in the comments. Uh, Castle Point fabulously beautiful part of the North Island. I remember my first visit to Castle Point was to go and do some filming at Tailing Docking. docking. Uh, and I tell you what, how on earth you hold down a scrim in that wind? Whew. Now, Michael Ross has said the late Norm Kirk PM is the best leader that he's ever worked with, but it's at the same time an absolute privilege to be trained by the late Sir Brian Lahore. And uh, Brett, thank you, Brett, for sending me through your um, breakdown of New Zealand ports, by the way, as well. Come on, Sarah, Tolliga Bay Wharf. Now, I do believe he's, Joel's not going to go over that part because he will be going back. He loves filming at Rhythm and Vines. He had a great time there at New Year's, so I think he's going to come down through Taupo. All right, get in the comments. Where do you believe Joel should visit on his North Island tour? And the other thing I'm calling for is what are the characteristics and who do you believe are some of our greatest leaders in New Zealand history? And uh, this is obviously, of course, there was a leaders debate last night. But, uh, of course, I, I do want to sort of carry on this theme all the way through uh, tonight's episode as well. Now, one leader is an 11-year-old Charolais bull by the name of Evolution. And this is from the Silverstream Charolais stud uh, near Lincoln in Canterbury. Why are we talking about one bull? Well, in a recent Australian bull sale this month, actually two bull sales, uh, Evolution was uh, come up in lights in terms of setting some dollar records. And this is well into his retirement. Silverstream principal Brent Fisher was delighted when Palgrove's chief executive, David Bonfield, rung with the news. This is an extraordinary... An absolutely amazing average, a whopping $21,133 
for an average of progeny. Now, Brent joins us to share this. Brent, um, evolution. He's been a pin-up child in the tea rooms uh, at <laughs> Silverstream for quite some time. This is really special, though. Why are we talking about this? What makes it so newsworthy? Well, I guess, um, you know, like uh, in, in breeding, there's always, I guess, the new bull coming along and, and uh, the new extra special one and things like that. And, and as stud breeders, that's what we're often always attracted to. But I guess what's special about uh, evolution is that he sort of stood the test of time, really. Uh, this would be the, the like, he's obviously, he's 11 years old. Um, he's still alive and kicking. Um, and this would be the sixth uh, uh, year that Palgrove have had sons and, and grandsons in the in the sale. Um, so, and, and this year, I think at the Palgrove sale, um, I think about a third of the Charolais bulls in the sale um, went back to evolution through him, um, direct sons, uh, grandsons, um, and and out of daughters. So, uh, yeah, it's quite quite a, a monumental, I, I guess, um, effort from. Him. And over all of this time as well, there must be those defining characteristics and attributes that evolution has been throwing to to um, contribute to good breeding genetics, uh, regardless of trends. Well, I think yeah, I think that's that's so right because um, you know the thing about evolution, the thing that makes him quite special, I think, is well the fact that he is eleven years old uh, means that he has to be very structurally sound, and I think that's been a great attribute of him. Um, and also, uh, it, it just seems his ability just to put a stamp on progeny. It just seems to go on and on through the generations, and um, and I think you know the you know like. These bulls, they, they go out and um, in, a, in Australia. And when you look at the averages, you say, well, that seems, you know, very, very high. But uh, what happens over in Australia is a lot of those bulls, they go on to uh, big properties and then they breed uh, subsequent bulls. So they'll go into, into Brahmin programs. They'll breed Charolais Brahmin bulls, which will then go out and be used in the in the and I guess just the size of the operations over there, like it's just like mind-boggling um, compared to what what we're dealing with over here. And I guess you know it's such a great thrill to think that he's gone over there and had such a great impact, um, you know, across uh, well not only for Palgrove but for Moongle and just the other uh, people that have used him. So uh, no, he's been outstanding, really. Now, we are focusing on a bit of a series in drought-proof in New Zealand farms, and there's a lot that we can learn from beef genetics from Australia. And, of course, uh, when you breed a Charolais bull here in New Zealand, it goes well into those uh, more drought-tolerant, uh, prone, sorry, areas of Australia. What do you believe from the, the focus of beef genetics here in New Zealand we should be focusing on for a resilient anim animal going into these uh, consistently scary conditions that New Zealand could be facing? Well, yeah, I think it's very it's it's very apt, um, and, and one of the things that we we often uh, we focus on uh, often, I guess, that just the production traits. So, like we, we pay a lot of attention to the production traits, but often what we've seen over the years is it's it's not the cattle that necessarily do really well in the in the good times. It's the ones that can hang in there in the bad times, and and the attributes that they have to have is generally fairly consistent. Is that they have to have uh, stru real terrific structure and also constitution. And if you can get those things, you're pretty much ninety percent of the way there. Because like in a in a good year, anything will do well. But it's in the bad years, and that's the that's the years that you have to have cattle that are, have got that ability just to hang in there often. And uh, often, you know, I guess it's in sheep, it's in cattle, it's and whatever. We we get hooked up in trends, but like the real the cattle that stand the test of time have those attributes because they can just hang in there year in year out. Now, of course, uh, Evolution, the bull, has a lot of attention signed by Silverstream Brumby and a cow called Glossy. How important is the dam line with Silverstream? Always very important. The, the females... Uh It isn't out of a top female. Like they just, it just doesn't seem to happen. Uh, Glossy, she was a tremendous female. She was a uh, just a moderate cow, just a really easy doing cow, just great constitution, great doability. 
uh, she was sired by a bull called Aja Flu, and we'd seen a, uh, a picture of Aja Flu, and he was in a, in a, a magazine I saw in France, and uh, I was really struck by just the way his legs were set, just the way he was standing on, I saw his picture, he was standing on some concrete, and just the way his legs were set, and everything just seemed right about the bull, uh, but we don't like using genetics unless we've actually seen them, so... Um, I flew over there with a with a friend of mine, and we were over there basically just there and back within a week um, over to France, and and we had this um, yeah we drove for about eight hours with these French people, and they just drove through all these little narrow roads, and and uh, we were driving down the road and. and got to a place near Leon and uh, I looked up on this hill and we, and I saw this ball and I thought, gee, that looks like a magnificent ball, but not really thinking anything of it. Next thing we were going up the driveway and that was the ball that we went all that way to see. And uh, yeah, he was just a terrific um, uh, ball, this um, Aja flu. And uh, so, yeah, he was the mother of, um, uh, he signed the mother of uh, of evolution. And, uh, yeah, and, and then on the sire side, uh, Brumby. Uh, Brumby, he was actually sired by a bull that went back to Palgrove. We went over to the Palgrove sale. I'd seen on a video this bull, and he was fairly well back in the catalogue, but he was a bull that we really liked, a uh, bull called Palgrove Accept. And so we bred the sun um, from him, which was uh, Brumby, uh, with the old Aussie Aussie connection, I guess, and then and he was a terrific, you know, just that same uh, soundness and structure. He back in his pedigree, he had a bull called Jonah, and Jonah was a terrific bull as far as his structure and constitution and doability, and he'd also done well over in Australia and New Zealand and things like that. So had a great background in his pedigree, but you know, like. He, he was just special right from the day he, he was born. You know, we just saw him, um, Anna and I were out in, in the paddock. Um, it was a cold, wet day. Uh, went out there, saw this calf. I thought, It was, wow, that, it was that love that at just, first but, sight. It was, it was, yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty cool just to think how he's just gone on and, and just had such an impact. Hey, um, Brent, before you go, the rise of spring bull sales and, of course, uh, yearling heifer sales, is this good for the industry in terms of uh, more quality uh, beef genetics going out there? Well, it's another option for people and, and, uh, and you know, a lot of those yearling sales are gaining more traction. Um, if you look overseas, you know, like um, – where, well, us, I guess, and Australia, seem, we sell a lot of two-year-old bulls, and often it's because of the nature of the country that they go into. But uh, if you look in North America, there's a lot of yearling sales, you know, uh, uh, mainly yearling sales, really. So, um, you know, it seems to be an ongoing, and, and it, it's a trend that seems to be rising. Uh, in many cases, just in some of the real harder country, the, the, a lot of those bulls are going to struggle. But, um, but you know, people will adapt and, 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 and make the bulls accordingly so yeah no, it, it seems to be going really well you're a very well traveled man um on the road checking out the progeny of silver stream joel would like to know where he should visit where is those favorite little hot spots around the north island challenging you <laughs> on this question to close what's your go-to place that you really love in the north island you can't say a bull sale yeah. <laughs> Mahi is where, where my in-laws come of from. Of course. Oh, well, we've got so yeah. much trouble with yeah. Jill and Pete. Mahi is beautiful. Yes, Jill and Pete. No, uh, they, would, they would welcome Joel with open arms. So uh, that would be great. Uh, I love Northland. Um, I love, uh, yeah, just up in that Northland area. I think it's just such an underrated place uh, in New Zealand. Um, Russell and things like that, just stunning places. You know, like we, you know, we are blessed, I guess, in New Zealand to have such a, a wonderful country and, and so many great places to visit. So, yeah. There we go, Joel. Note those down. And I would like a report back on what you learn from Jill and Pete when you go and stay with them on Mahia Peninsula. <laughs> wonderful. Brent Fisher there from Silverstream Charolais. Now, coming up after the break, we're going to be joined by Mark Barracliffe, the president from the Shearers Contractors Association. Shearers left off the list where of Chris Farfoy's list, this is, with those border exemptions of the uh, desperate need we need for parts of the primary sector, horticulture, rural contractors, uh, our vineyards, and uh, of course our veterinaries were, veterinarians were on that, but Shearers left off. How does Mark feel about that? Coming up very shortly on Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country.
Balance has its own team of innovation specialists. It's our job to lead the way, working with some of the most cutting edge science and research. We've got partnerships with some of the best suppliers in the world, so our farmers get the very best products for New Zealand farms. And in every region across the country, the conditions are very different, and farmers and growers' needs are too. That's why we're always looking for solutions that are just right, like here at our Huntley Service Centre. And here in Canterbury, we've got a self-service silo, so I can pick up fit when it suits me. And here in Morrinsville, we've got a world-class mill. That means that we can safely deliver our customers with the freshest, highest quality feed and minerals. It's about putting the customer first because that's what drives our business. We've been focusing on faster turnaround of orders. We've got to get the right products to the right places at the right times. Here in Taranaki, we've got New Zealand's only urea manufacturing plant. It's where we create our premium sustained fertiliser. We're supplying nationwide and working locally. By getting to know you and what you want to achieve, we can help you get there. And with the new My Balance platform, Balance has put my farm at my fingertips. In fact, we offer support in all sorts of ways, sharing the best nutrition practice with farming families across the country. Whether we're talking about animal health, farm productivity, or looking after our natural environment, sustainability underpins everything we do. We use our local expertise and the latest tools to help farmers and growers navigate the changing regulations so you can leave your farm in great shape for the future. And we can be really accurate avoiding areas like wetlands and waterways with our award-winning SpreadSmart tech. It makes the job far safer, more efficient and gives you the best results. When you've got access to that kind of know-how, you've got the support you need to make sure you're farming sustainably. It's that kind of thinking that'll keep us going for generations to come. Together creating the best soil and feed on earth. Yesterday, Minister for Immigration Chris Farfoy announced that a limited number of overseas veterinarians and farm machinery operators, as well as horticulture and vineyard workers, were going to be allowed into New Zealand uh, after the government uh, granted these exemptions for these professions only. These skills have been sa stated as required urgently to avoid the loss of crop and animal feed uh, that is ready for harvest also creating a lack of shearers for sheep that need to be shorn ASAP was not on the list. Now, Mark Barraclough, the president of the Shearers Contractors Association from New Zealand, uh, is joining us now. As I would love to know, Mark, are you frustrated about being left off the bill? Oh, it's definitely disappointing because um, we can see a problem looming, hence why we um, put this application in with the feds and federated farmers. And we, we have had it reviewed again, but, uh, yeah, obviously didn't get the nod. So um, we can the problem's still coming um, and we need to try and sort it out ASAP, really. Can you give us a scale yeah. of the problem? Um, being a transient workforce, it's sort of hard to judge because we bounce around a lot between Australia and New Zealand and obviously the UK guys come in. So it is hard to know, but obviously, you know, we're chasing a couple of hundred shearers here in New Zealand for the main shear period. Australia's trying to get 500 um, shearers over into their country at the moment. So, um, yeah, although it's not as huge as maybe the fruit fruit pickers and stuff, um, People-wise, each person that we get here, you know, they, they bang out 200-odd sheep a day and multiply that by um, the days they're going to be here. So, yeah, it can be quite a big problem. And, of course, we're talking there about uh, animal feed loss, but what about animal welfare issues? Is, is heating up already here in Lincoln? Um, and, of course, that backlog is only going to eat more and more into the hotter periods. Yeah, definitely. It, like it's not happening for us yet. Um, we're more into that November and December when it really starts to hit and it'll flow through to the North Island and then down to the South Island if we get behind. So, yeah, it's not only animal uh, welfare issues and, and getting the, um, the wool off in time, but also it, it'll cost the farmer a bit. He's either got to get him back into dip or mm. manage uh, possible fly strikes. So it, it's just a bit more time and cost going on to, to them. So... We're just sort of promoting at the moment, if we don't get the tick, well, um, you know, you've just got to get that early commu communication going with your, your shearers and your shearing contractors to try and work out a way to mitigate a bit of the pain. 
Uh, and we've had rural contractors, Roger Pardon on before, as uh, as well as many across the, the the sector who've been crying out for staff on serious country. What is their process of trying to bang on immigration's door, and why do you believe they've gone down the route of some but not all? So we just put our, um, an application in supported with federated farmers or, or, or they put one in and um, backed up by us, whichever way around you want to do it. But um, And then we deal with MPI. So And then MPI advise the, um, the ministers on, on what they think. So, yeah, other than our dealings with MPI, who have been very good in, in understanding and, and they get it, um, it's obviously... Yeah, that they pass the information on, and it's made a cabinet level where maybe you know maybe they don't um, they don't think of the the bigger picture for us, but I suppose they've got to prioritise it. And at the end of the day, we've got, only got so many immigration um, quarantine spaces, so maybe that's limiting it. But you know, our window is getting pretty tight. We're looking at bringing people in from the UK, so if we don't can't start the process soon, even though the problem's not till December, we'll. Hey, the, the, the old horse is already bolted, really. What, what does that process look like in expense uh, and also the risk of Australia pinching them too? Yeah, well, you've got the, um, the added ex... Um, hang on, sorry. <laughs> Fatal mistake. <laughs> um, you've got the added um, problem of um, the availability of flights, the availability of quarantine... And then, um, you know, just just the sheer cost of the flight and the quarantine. So, yeah, even though we get the nod, we've still got to attract attract these guys from the UK over. And we'll look what's happening in the UK at the moment. Who's to say they're not going to have issues coming home as well themselves? You know, you just don't know. So it's yeah, it's they are there are quite a few still expressing interest to come from the UK, which is great. But at the moment, we haven't got a definite answer for them. Mm. Now, I know that you are representing the Shearers Contractors Association, but I was just forward thinking with regards to uh, sharing sports and those those international participants. Would that, would, what does that mean sort of for the circuit in terms of uh, being able to have our, our own internal uh, competition here on the ground? Does, does that mean it takes away any of the competition? I mean, New Zealand Shearers, let's be honest, are some of the best in the world, so... Oh, yeah, definitely, and that's why the guys from the UK, especially America, throughout Europe, they want to come here and and compete with the best to to up their skills. So if they're not going to – if they can't come into the country, well, they're not going to be at our sharing shows and and supporting them, which they are great at supporting Mm. because, like I just said, they come here to get better. They do that day in and day out in the shed, and then they go and um, really test their stuff in the weekends against us and – um, hey, they've come a long way, and um, yeah, they, it's going to be a big loss to to sharing sports, and and that's you know even our community, our community shows are they're a real feel good factor. You know your A and P shows and that um, whether you come in there to eat a hot dog, share a sheep, or, or run a dog or whatever, um, you, you knock one of those um, those areas out or lessen it. Well, everyone feels it a bit. It's just um, yeah, it limits that. The great country shows that we put on. Mm. Hey, our thoughts go out to you and your contractors. The, the uh, Contract Association represents Mark because it's a challenge and frustrating, I can admit. Um, so, therefore, yeah, take care. And we look forward to following and the day that I get a press release to say the sharers are allowed in. It'll be a great day. Um, and wonderful. I was just thinking, of, and with regards to what Mark was just saying there, one of my favourite AMP shows is Little River, where you've got to, you know, chew the wheat bix and scull the bear and then turn the old um, handpiece over and share a sheep. So, you know, that's just one of many, but the actually seeing those uh, athletes and that is what they are in full swing is absolutely an, a crucial and amazing part of our AMP shows. And let's hope they stop dropping like flies as we were talking on the show uh, throughout. Now, of course, we're talking about leadership within this country and to close the show, I'm really looking 
looking forward to having one of our true agricultural leaders on the show, Doug Avery, and everything he's done for uh, not only drought-proofing farms, but also in terms of building resilient farms uh, around mental health. It's Mental Health Awareness Week. We've been talking about that a little bit throughout the show, and we've also been talking about leadership. So what an excellent way to end the show with Doug Avery after the break. This is Sarah's Country. Really pleased we got into this. Thanks for your help, Dave. It's a good idea, honey. You reckon it'll come out? Cover it in talcum powder, leave it 10 minutes, and you'll be fine. Good call, Dave. Good call on getting those security cameras, Dave. You call a new one here? Yeah, kind of. When you've got decisions to make, we'll be there to help you make the right call. I'd go for those ones, Bob. Yeah, good call. Did you choose these? Oh, you know. For great advice and insurance, talk to FMG. Every morning, Kiwi farmers wake up to produce higher quality food. Yet, every night, some Kiwi families are going to sleep hungry. Meet the Need is a charity founded by farmers, and it's here to change all that. We're about New Zealand farmers feeding New Zealand families by donating a small part of what we grow when we can. You can help us make sure no one in New Zealand goes to sleep hungry again. Visit meettheneed.org and follow us on social. Welcome. The, for those who may have just joined us live on Serious Country, uh, we have had a wonderful show in regards to an overarching theme around leadership. Uh, I wanted to talk about that, in particular following last night's leaders' debate. Regardless of your political leaning, uh, the topic of leadership is something that we talk about a lot in the primary sector and here on Serious Country. I'm just going to go down to the comments. Thank you so much for being active. Uh, we've got two particular topics we'd like to get some comments around uh, because of course we were live last night during the leaders debate so Joel's itinerary around the North Island was looking a little bit lean in places to go there's a lot of people that are enjoying the Gisborne area Joel uh, and I know that that's one of the areas you're probably avoiding because you, you were there last year for New Year's and you're going back to film at RNV. and uh, but of course we do have some beautiful places that have come in here James has said to make sure that Joel heads along to Hobbiton. Um, he, he did tell me, I think that was on the list in near Matamata. And of course, Sophie has come in to say, make sure you take Sarah across to Hawke's Bay. Fantastic wine region. And Graham has said uh, there is some, a beautiful place called Zelandia in Wellington, which I know Joel I'm is already going to. Joel yeah. <laughs> loves his wildlife, loves his bird life. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Please send in your comments because we're building Joel's itinerary around the North Island and we're also talking about leadership. Uh, Michael has said uh, Dame Catherine Tizard, the Governor General, was certainly one of the greats. And Posey's written in to say, Good to Great is a fantastic book that spells out leadership. Only a few level four leaders also feel privileged to be led by one. Is that a wee plug? <laughs> well done, Pose. I have been introduced to a fantastic new book that I'm reading called New Power. And I tell you what, when you read that, you start to understand the um, systemic changes that are happening and, uh, and you understand old power is out and new power is in and where that comes in a new form of leadership. Uh, and turning now to our last guest of this evening, a leader in multiple parts of our primary sector. Lucerne and of course uh, our mental health and our, and our way that we approach things is industry motivator and advocate Doug Avery. In this week's Farmers Weekly, he's urging farmers struggling to adapt to more frequent droughts and tough growing conditions to take a deeper look into their own motivations and responses to deal with an issue that is not going to pass anytime soon. And Doug joins us now, as I fondly like to say, Uncle Doug. Good evening. How are you? 
Yeah, good, uh, good, Sarah. Nice to be here, um, Auntie, Auntie Sarah. Oh, I'm not. Re- am I at that stage yet? <laughs> that's that's got to be fair. No, no, that's not. I'll take that with a compliment. Thank you so much, yeah, no, Doug. It is. It is. Yeah. Hey, look. Nice so, to be here. Yeah, thank you. We're just talking about leadership coming in, and I know we'll get to that in a point because if I could talk to you about leadership for three hours straight. Um, but let's talk about um, drought proofing. It's been becoming a bit of a series that Richard Rennie's doing on in Farmers Weekly, and. Uh, and a lot of people in New Zealand know your personal journey, but um, what are some of those those really key things that we need to think about early in response to this? Uh, I guess one of the things, and you know, as you probably realise, and I need, I need to make sure that everyone understands this, I don't operate the farm now, so Fraser does. Uh, but Bonavere, out to our farm on the eastern Marlborough this year, uh, has experienced probably the worst drought uh, for twenty years from Christmas time through to June. Uh, I think Fraser demonstrated a masterclass in drought management, uh, and it's been something that uh, we as a family have built up because we got absolutely thrashed 20 years ago. Um, It affected me hugely, and I wanted to make sure that going forward, uh, as a family, we grew knowledge and we grew capability around dealing with stuff. Uh, I didn't specifically set out to do uh, maybe drought. We just decided we wanted to be really good at stuff. Uh, The cornerstone of that is um, if you don't measure stuff, you can't manage stuff. So we started, we were early adopters of technology. Uh, That all flowed on and from our recovery. And going into this drought, we've got the greatest amount of technology operating. So we get early signs. Uh, We get early hints. Uh, and when we get those hints, we act. And so we never, ever worry about um, uh, whether it might rain after we've made a decision. We've got those thresholds all set there. And there's a very good reason for this. Um, our family has experienced me going through hellish times, and that could have been the finish of me quite easily. And that actually matters to my family and to me more than uh, anything else. So if I go back to Fraser's management, uh, he realised um, by about late April, early May, that we weren't going to make the cut, and he sold down very heavily. And a lot of the local people said to him, uh, Fraser, you're ridiculous, you're selling so much stuff. But he's been back out there buying and making up the difference now. Mm. So what we do is we've got the systems to manage We know the weights that stuff have to be to produce a certain time. And if they look like they're going to drop off that, we know what pasture covers we need to have. We we know what feed we consume. And if we're going to get knocked off that, we don't spread it out and have misery right across our farm. We hold the standard of what we've still got. So it still comes in at industry best. Now, Bonavere is going on show on the 20th of October. And any person who wants to come and see what drought management's all about, we have got the crop of lambs down there this year to be showed and envied. Huge lambing percentage, fantastic stuff. The pastures weren't destroyed. We didn't spend a cent on bought in feed. Hmm. Um, and we are now in a grand position. Uh, we were brought in a whole lot of cattle cheap again. We're going to be able to finish those and we'll have everything finished before it goes brown completely. We're sitting on a nice edge again for the summer, but we won't get caught. So it's about actually investing in knowledge. Yeah, and also the other thing, you you brought up the word capability, but also the word capacity and making sure that you've got that gas in the tank and and capacity being uh, your strategy is something that um, the leadership around me is is drilling in at all times because, you know, if you're right at the edge of life, of your business, at every moment, you're at tipping point, aren't you? Uh, Yeah, so so you brought up those two words, is. And every transaction that we do in life, whether it's a, um, an emotional experience with another person or whether it's a business experience, uh, there's four C's in a batch of work. So people come along and say to me, Doug, you know, like we know that you've tripled the size of your farm, quadrupled the size of your farm. It's going really, really, really well. I want to do something similar. And I say, oh, fantastic. Uh, when are you going to start? And they'll say, they'll look at me and they'll say, um, well, you know, like I'll start uh, when I've got the confidence. Hmm. I said, really? 
you, you think you're going to do this huge job and you'll have confidence before you start. You'll never start. You'll be one of those gonna, I'm going to do it one day. Uh, then they'll sort of reframe that a bit and they'll say, oh, I'll start when I've got the capacity. And I'll say, no, you won't do that either. Capacity is developed once you get into the grind of the job. There's two C's that come before that. You've given me capacity, the third C, confidence, the fourth C. The first thing is you have to commit. And so, you know, we're, we, we always decide when things are really good in farming, are we committed to go through the next trough? Uh, once we've done that, we go through the toughest sea of the whole lot, courage. Every step, when you, you, know, when you set up the show, uh, Sarah, I'm sure anyone that takes a massive step out there in life, whatever it is, uh, when you accept a proposal, whatever it is, you take that commitment step and then you have to go through the period of, cur- uh, of courage. And when you're in the courage time, I don't know anyone that doesn't feel uncomfortable. That's when you wake up at 2 o'clock and say, oh, my God, I've borrowed too much money or whatever. And the wise counsel, and if you do what I what I um, encourage people to do is travel with clever, competent mentors, mm. uh, you can reach out to them and say, shit, you know, what the hell's going on here? And they'll say, look, we already talked about the courage stage and you've just got to get stuck in and develop your capability. Now, capability... Uh, when you're developing that, that's new learning. And if you think about the Mental Health Foundation, they see learning as one of the key five strategies for well-being. Hmm. And then when you get confident and you think, oh, this has been magic. Look at us. Look at us go now. Uh, then bugger my days, it's time to do another set of four. So constant life learning. And, you know, if people, are, if people have got change in climates, uh, you've got to change the system. Hmm. And then you could be like what we are and have fun year in, year out. <laughs> I, I don't ever want to go where I went again, and I hate seeing uh, my fellow farmers go through hell on earth buying food from the other end of the country, which is just going to go to animals which won't be able to convert it. It's not the way to do it. Yeah, or other parts of the world as well, Doug. Um, and you touched yeah. on that. And can I actually just share? Um, I went through a hellish time and I had my confidence knocked to hell and yep. back and to get up and do this show. Um, that yep. took 12 months to repair and my confidence and, and get back to that point. And the very first part I did was I surrounded myself with what you said, clever mentors that believe in you, that yep. give you that sense of courage to get back on. And then the rest is history. You just get on with it. And then, like you said, when you're really humming, you're having a hell of a lot of fun. But it takes that when you do have that confidence knock to really surround yourself with those right people. For those listening and watching and for those who are trying to support others how would you get that right support around you um the 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 real key part to that is uh is the wisdom you know i talk about building resilience and john kerwin said to me one day don't like your word doug he said that's hard enough and i said to him look jk i said it's about actually developing the strategies in good times that's, when, that's the time to develop your resilience. That's when you want to be out asking, you know, like asking the questions, am I ready for the summer now? Hmm. What do I need to do to make sure that I can make the best of it? So if you've made a host, host of bad decisions last autumn and into the winter, chances are you've probably got a pretty messy process still on your hands. So our whole process at Bonnaroo 20 years ago, we decided that we had to get ahead of the failure. So we were like the fire brigade running around the bloody place, putting out fires. Mm. You've got to get away from that strategy. You've got to get on top of it. Uh, well-being is not about not having bad times. It's about having the tools and, and capacity that you develop in your courage time to take these wonderful steps in time that it means you're going smiling. People are um, an incredibly optimistic when they're going into a drought. It's going to rain. And then when it doesn't, they're incredibly depressed. And we need to move away from that and just get our whole process. If I go right back to the start, if you can't manage it, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And I'll go one step further. If you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. 
That gives you something to think about. It does, but then my next question leads into the fact that this primary industry is so based on fact and science that we actually don't appreciate the emotion that's involved in this entire industry, do we? This entire industry is motivated by fear and greed, and that makes all of our transactions, um, as well as connection, like Doug and someone wanted to keep it. But no, but there's a lot of emotion connected to our transactions, our thinking, like our fire brigade moment of fear and greed right yeah. at the edge of that cliff rather than that, that preparation. And all of the people around us transacting are working on fear and greed. When you don't have an embedded deep strategy, how do you get away from just living on the edge and actually bring it back and build that, that team around you? Uh, yeah, well, that's that's a really good point. And, you know, to me, that all comes back to the concept of, of mentoring, uh, having that team. And so for me, it, it, I had to dig deep, as I guess you did yourself. I, I had to ask myself, what's my why? Why am I here? Why am I on this earth? Do I want to carry on farming and grass here? And, you know, like at the end, of, at that time, people said, this is the worst place in New Zealand to farm. Uh, people tell me when they drive past that farm now, my God, it always looks great. And that was just a head thing. That was just, I realised that my heart and the reason that I tipped over was because I didn't know how to manage real basic stuff. And so we set on a journey of continuous learning. And, you know, like the current generation, Fraser, he's taking that to a new level. So anyone that's watching this that wants to, uh, you know, uh, an excellent drill in um, um, management and, and administration. We're a board Calvin farm and in drought management, Dr. Derek Moot, come along on the 16th of October. I think they've got about 100 reservation um, bookings already and there's a lot of people coming from all over New Zealand and that's really cool because it's going to be a great day and, and what, we had a strategy meeting a year ago, two years ago, and we decided that we'd been the same for 20 years and it was time for us to take a new and fresh look at the way we, we operated our business. And guess what we did? First thing we did is we've upped our measuring. And we got Greg Shepard from Shepard Agriculture. He's mm -hmm. a freebie promo for him. Greg Shepard came in and um, designed a, a, a dashboard for us. And we've got uh, professionals in the area of, of climate management and all that sort of stuff bringing it in. And soon we will have super duper knowledge. And that's the best you can do. Doug, can I um, ask you lastly, for those farmers who are listening um, and that real victim mentality of uh, not being able to control those outside uh, influences, regulation, climate, um, the pandemic affecting us globally, how do you get a sense of control when the world feels like it's against you? Um, well, you know, I guess... I guess it, <laughs> we've all got a sense at any given time that there's aspects of our lives that are against us. But it, um, it's about your circle of influence and your circle of control. And so, you know, there are things that we can influence and there's things that we can't influence. And, uh, you know, everybody's got two circles. There's your circle of, sorry, sorry, the circle of concern. We've all got a lot of concerns. And then inside of that, there's a tiny circle, and that's your circle of influence. And as an individual, that was something that I learned from one of my brother-in-laws earlier on. He said, concentrate on your circle of influence and he explained it to me. And, you know, pretty much I stay in there or every now and again, I would probably quite regularly get out and have a bit of a lash on politics. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, uh, if you build your circle of influence, that's the best you can do. And, you're, you know, yeah. you're doing that right now with, with this thing. I mean, you... You know, everybody has a time when they hit the wall. And, you know, if you think about that, and, and I'm sure you will feel this way, those times where they're damn hard at that time, uh, they are the make, the making of you. So I look back and I'm 65 years old or young, and I've had 60 absolutely awesome years, and five buggers. And those five bugger of a years taught me how to think. And from that time on, I would have to say that I've had more than my share it's not been hard anymore. It's been easy. Because I learned then, don't actually do this stuff. Don't listen to other people and just say, oh, I'm going to do it one day. Commit to it. Build the courage. Find the capability. Bring the people in with you. And then be prepared to get confident. And then don't sit there and think, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm in the comfort zone now. 
Go and have another lick. Go and have another lick. Build the next tree. Climb the next bugger. There's no end of trees. And, you know, like I've got a next door neighbour who's over 80 and he took me for a two hour fly around Marlborough the other day. And, like, he's like a 40 year old in his attitude. Mm. I said to Wendy, you know, I don't think there's another 80 year old, 80 year old in the country that I would fly with in a single engine plane. I'd go with him anywhere. He could take me to the moon if, he had, if I had half a chance. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, people, we, we, we need to turn the conversation around, not blaming everyone else for, for where our lives are. It's about us finding the people to support us to grow our lives. Everybody has two lives. There's one life that started before you and it will finish long after you or go on afterwards. And then there's your life and it's bloody special. Make sure you fill it. Not fill it, fill it. And that's enough for me, isn't it? Oh, Uncle Doug, it's always a privilege to have you on this show. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Um, we could keep, keep talking for so long. And we are not bound by a time frame. We're not bound by anything. If we wanted to keep talking, I know we'll have an audience for the next <laughs> half an hour. Um, I can see them all coming in. They're all enjoying it. Um, and, of course, uh, Doug has been saying a Friday, the 16th of October, at the Avery's property, uh, Westpac, B- Bailey's, Marlborough, Sheep and Beef, Farmer of the Year, and this is the field day that you can get along to. Absolutely agree with everything that Doug says um, with regards to associating your decisions and where you can take that. When you get your mental health and your, your head right, and um, yes, certainly I definitely did share. Thank you so much for commenting. That I uh, certainly am bringing with that because I got to that point where I was battered and down in my um, sort of... Um, you know, enthusiasm for what I was doing. And then I got to a point where I said, well, you know, if not you, then who? And I got up off the ground again and carried on punching. And it took a lot of confidence, took a lot of courage. Um, And I'm absolutely glad that uh, I am here today because I tell you what, I wish I could go back five years ago and tell that girl, you know, where you'll be if you just dig it in and get through. And I am the making of that person. Um, And so, so freaking proud to be here. But at the same time, also so absolutely privileged by my circle of influence that have got me here as well. That is all we've got time for it tonight on Serious Country in alliance with the absolutely beautiful, wonderful, generous, kind people at Farmers Weekly that have put me in this position. Uh, Farmersweekly.co.nz for all of your in-depth agri-journalism. And of course, get in touch, Sarah at SarahsCountry.com. I love hearing from you. Your feedback, your suggestion for guests, and uh, of course, just your general Brett's watching, port connoisseur tasting notes Brett I absolutely loved it thank you so so much Uh, we are available on podcast and on YouTube and uh, of course we'll be back on Monday night Monday through Wednesdays uh, Sarah's Country is live from 7 o'clock but of course you can listen to us uh, individual interviews and full shows on demand on podcast take care of yourself your family your community and uh, have a wonderful weekend good night go well This is Sarah's Country.